G'day Jaffa Adventures, Terry King here. Welcome to the channel. Today I'm going to talk about water management, which seems a little bit strange when I'm sitting out in the middle of a rainforest, but hey, it just happens to be where I am and I'm feeling a bit talkative today. So grab yourself your favorite cold drink, sit down and let's have a chat about water management in a camping situation. So I'm going to talk about water management in three broad categories. Number one, storage. Number two, usage. And number three, refilling. And to put this discussion into context, my friends and I do a lot of remote area traveling, particularly in arid locations. And when you're talking remote traveling in arid locations, water management is critical. It's as critical as fuel. Probably actually even more so because your life actually depends on it. So the first storage methodology for me is the humble jerry can. And I've got a double jerry can holder here on the back of the truck. They're a 20 liter jerry can. They're rated as 20 liters, but you can actually squeeze about 23 liters into them. So if I'm doing some remote travel in an arid location, I'll carry two jerry cans on the back of the truck here full of water, giving me roughly 46 liters in this capacity. The next area where I store water, particularly in arid and remote applications, is what we call lovingly a hog bag. And basically that's a water bladder. By the way, the name hog bag comes from a very good mate of mine whose nickname is Hog, and he's actually the one that introduced me and a lot of my friends in Jaffa to these water bladders. So let's take a look at what I'm talking about. And that's what the fat little girl looks like when she's filled up. 110 liters, ready to rock and roll. Now obviously to get the water out of there, so you simply turn that tap on and pop out that bung. The next area for water storage, believe it or not, are just humble little bottles. And it can either be the 600 mil or 750 mil bottles, or the cubes that you can get from Woolies, the square cubes that pack away absolutely beautifully. And those water containers we use strictly for drinking. We know it's going to be a pure water source, uncontaminated. We know that we're not going to be fighting anything like gastro. So it's a wonderful way to isolate that pure drinking water from the rest of the water that you use for things like showers and cooking. Now believe it or not, the other form and the last form of water storage is in your humble beverage. Be it CC and dry, a beer, soft drinks, whatever. That's actually a lot of water and I find when I'm on a trip, if I'm having a few beers or a few CCs, I actually don't drink too much water, as in drinking water. I know alcohol is supposed to dehydrate you, but hey, if I've had a skin full of these, I can tell you my wee's telling me I'm not dehydrated. So what does all of this mean in terms of the total volume of water that I carry on a remote arid application. Well, the water bladder, that holds 115 liters. Add another 46 liters from the jerry can on the spare wheel holder, and I'm up to 161 liters total volume. Say, add another two 10 liter cubes, the Woolies cubes of water, that's another 20 liters. That takes me up to 181 liters of total water volume, and that's excluding any of the alcohol that I'm carrying along. So now that we've discussed the total storage capacity that I've got in terms of water, let's move on to the next subject matter, which is usage. Now you might think me and my friends a little bit of a cream puff for this, but one thing that I want to have every single evening after a hard day's traveling is a shower. So from a usage point of view, let's talk showers, how much I use, and how it's all hooked up. First of all, we've got ourselves our humble jerry can. In the wings here, I store a couple of hoses. They're just simple garden hoses with quick connectors on the end. My suction line has got a sand spear on it. So if I'm ever on a beach area where I can pull up some fresh water by digging a small hole in you know, a little runoff like you see on Fraser, that's when that sand spear comes in really, really handy. The other advantage with the sand spear is it actually acts as a little bit of a filter and prevents the water pump from getting clogged up with crap. Sand spear into the humble jerry can on one end and quick connect end. I've got a little 
suction hose coming out the back of the truck. That's just a blanking bung. And that plugs straight into there. That line is plumbed all the way up to the front of the truck where the water pump is located. So let's go up to the front side and have a look at what we've got. All right, we're up the front end of the truck. We've got our delivery hose or our pressure hose. And what I've got as a shower rose is just one of these cheap garden nozzles that I'm sure everybody has at home. It's got different settings on it. And the one that's most important from a remote area travel point of view and a water conservation perspective is this one here called Mist. So the water pump is located inside of the bull bar along with the heat exchanger. I've got the pump mounted here in front of the bull bar and the heat exchanger also mounted here in front of the bull bar. The heat exchanger has two lines that run to the engine. This one here which is the feed line. That one there is the return line. So the flow of hot water through the heat exchanger runs that way. The pump, on the other hand, suction comes in here, comes out the back side, runs into the heat exchanger in the opposite direction of the flow of the hot water for the engine, and out through this pressure line. Now I just reach into this pressure line, and through the bull bar, I can pull out the hose connector, and simply connect up the shower rows. Unfortunately, I can't show an install video on this one because it's been done long before I could even spell YouTube. But you get the idea of how it's mounted and what it looks like. Now this suction line on the pump runs along the chassis of the car. We're in the rear wheel well now runs through here, up along the underside, and comes out to a hose fitting here. In the engine bay, you need to tap into the cooling system of the vehicle to obtain your hot water source. There are two critical parts to a successful installation. Firstly, use decent hose clamps. You don't want one of these letting go, dumping all your coolant onto the road, and cooking your engine before you can shut it down. Secondly, you have to get the direction of flow right. You want the engine coolant to flow through the heat exchanger in the opposite direction to the clean water path. I tapped into the cooling system here. To determine the direction of coolant flow, I simply started the engine for a second or two and watched which way the coolant was getting pushed out of the hose I cut. Once I identified that, I tapped into the coolant line with a 90 degree brass joiner pointed towards the exchanger and a straight joiner to bring the return line back to the engine bay. I routed the hoses under the aux battery and the coolant overflow tank, past the driver's side of the radiator on a right-hand drive vehicle, and down to the heat exchanger mounted on the bull bar cross member. Simples. I simply reach into the bull bar, pull out that hose, again, disconnect a bung that I've got there to keep crap out of it, grab our garden hose, quick connected her up, grab our nozzle, click, shower's ready to go. Now we switch our water pump on, and we charge our line, and there we go. And with that mist spray that we've got there, Jill and I can have a decent shower in five liters of water in total. Two and a half for Jill, two and a half for me. It's absolutely amazing how conservative you can be with that fine mist. So what that actually means is we can have a hot shower every night, even when we're doing remote area traveling in arid locations. And of course you'd be sensible as well. If you're in an outback situation and you're running low on water, well the first thing that you can do is cut back on your showers and not have any. In our case we don't save all that much because we're only using five liters, but hey, every bit can help. So that is just wonderful. We can have a clean, fresh sleep every night while traveling in arid and dusty locations. You got the best of both worlds. So having said that, the sun's starting to set. I'm gonna have myself a shower and I'm not gonna have the camera running. So for anybody interested in what these glide showers actually look like when you buy them new, I've got a new kit here that I can share with you. So you get some instructions, but they're relatively generic instructions. So uh, you really need to jump onto YouTube and have a look at the instructions that are 
more specific to your vehicle. This unit here is the heart of the whole system. So that is your heat exchanger. And on here there are two markings. One says coolant and one says fresh. So what that means basically is you hook your coolant lines up to this side, you hook your fresh water lines up to this side. Doesn't matter which direction of flow that the coolant is flowing as long as the water, the fresh water, is flowing in the opposite direction. So if your coolant's flowing through the exchanger in this direction, you want your water to flow in an opposite direction. That way it picks up the maximum amount of heat possible. So you get your exchanger, you get a mounting bracket. I actually did use this on the 200, so I've got that mounted up to the cross brace on the ARB Summit Bull Bar. But if it doesn't work, you can fabricate your own bracket up easily enough. There's a couple of tangs on either side of the heat exchanger where you can mount it and make sure that that's firm and doesn't jiggle about. The next thing you get in the kit is a flow jet pump. That's a simple 12 volt pump. From a spec point of view, it draws about seven and a half amps and it flows 11 liters a minute. And these are wonderful little pumps. I've never had a drama with these. I've had one of these in my 80 series for 25 years and I've had one of these in the 200 now for five years. Never given me any drama whatsoever. Every once in a while, if it sucks up a bit of crap, you gotta take the head off and clean the pump out of it. But if you filter your water well enough, that'll never ever be a problem. Two wires, a positive and a negative, pretty simple stuff. They do give you a filter in the kit, so you can use that. You can hook your hoses up to either end. I use that sand spear or that sand filter that I showed you earlier in the video. That works absolutely fantastic. That sand spear does not come with the kit, whereas this does. So if you wanna go down that route, you'll have to buy that separately. These guys do sell it. And then you get a bunch of hose clamps, bits and bobs to uh, help mount the thing and you get a two-pole rocker switch. The other components that come with the kit are some heater hoses to allow you to mount that heat exchanger up. And this particular one has two different bends in it, so you can chop the hose on the bend that suits your application the best. And then they give you a bunch of straight hose as well, which is fantastic. And I've never had to buy any additional hoses. I've always been able to use what's being provided in the kit. You get a couple of ends that fit into the end of the um, flow jet pump and those are straight and also angled so that's pretty cool and the last thing that you get in the kit that i have actually thrown out is the shower rose and the hot water hose that there is where you can mount your shower rose up in onto a wall or whatever anyway the reason that i end up throwing that out is the hose has got a threaded end on it so every time you want to use it you got to screw it on or screw it off that's no good for me. I'd rather have something much, much quicker, which is why I've got the quick connect. The other thing is you can't regulate the water flow very well with the rows that they give you. It's a single pattern and it's either on or off. I like those little garden sprayers that I've got where you can take it right down to a mist if you want to, to conserve water to the maximum. So I end up throwing that out, but who, you know, if you're not doing any remote or desert applications, this might work just perfectly fine for you. I do rate these kits very highly. I absolutely love my Glide Shower. They're a local company as well. They're on Bribey Island. I don't know anything about them other than they make great shower kits and I've paid full tilt for all of my kits that I've ever bought off of these guys. So if that application might interest you, reach out to the guys. I'm sure they'd love to hear from you. All right, let's jump back into the rest of the subject matter. I should be done my shower by now. So let's wrap up this discussion on usage, shall we? So for two people, we use five liters a day for showering. For things like beers, soft drinks, coffees, water, we use eight liters a day for two people. For cooking, we average about a liter a day. Some days if we're cooking pasta, for example, use more than that. Other days when there's no pasta, we might use any water at all. For cleaning and washing up, we use three liters a day. That leaves us with a total of 17 liters of usage on a daily basis between two people. As I mentioned earlier, I've got about 223 liters in total. If we take our 17 liters a day usage, that gives us about 13 days to be self-sufficient in the desert based on what I'm carrying there. Normally, I'll plan for 10 days so that I've got sort of three days of buffer up our sleeves. If I know I'm going to be in a remote area for a longer period of time than that, and I don't think that I'll be able to get some water, I'll obviously just throw additional jerry cans into the back of the car to make up for that difference. Let's say I run into trouble out in the middle of nowhere. If I can't sort the issue out myself, I've got a sat phone 
to make an emergency call and worst case scenario, help can come out to me. But let's say that I'm stranded out there. How can I conserve? Well, one, I don't need to have a shower. I can eliminate the liter that I'm using in cooking and I can eliminate the four liters that I'm using in cleaning up and I can eliminate alcohol altogether, which is a dehydrating agent uh, and replace that with water. And that gives me a savings of 10 liters a day. That's a massive amount of savings and that will stretch out the amount of buffer time that I've got in remote areas by a very, very large margin. Before we move on to refilling, here's a little hack for you. These taps here are notoriously terrible for turning when you want to turn them on and off. They actually turn in the direction of whatever way you're going and they're just a pain in the backside. Here's something that I've found that works quite well. I picked up this little tap from eBay. I can't remember what I paid, but it was only a few bucks. And they're absolutely brilliant. You can take your finger and just flick them open and flick them closed. You can use a pinky if you want to. That's just so much more convenient than those stupid twisty ones that spin in the hole. So if you want to save yourself a little bit of grief, I can recommend these little suckers. Let's wrap this video on water up with our refilling options. And you've got two main sources that you'll be able to get your water from, obviously in towns or at home or out in the bush. So if you're in a town, what I like to do is carry these little garden connectors. I've just got them in the seat pocket behind the seat. And should we find some water sources in towns, like at showgrounds, for example, you can often connect these up to the water source and fill directly into your jerry can or into your hog bag, for example. Here's how I've got that hooked up to fill up. There's a fill line. I've just put a garden connection on the end of it and blanked that garden connection off with a bit of silicone. So we pop that garden end off and put one of these joiners on, like so. And then we grab our garden hose and just simply plug it straight in. Tough to do one-handed. That's it there. And she's filling. You should be able to hear that rushing in there. Now, when filling, there's an air breather that sits on the top of the bag as well. So what I do with that little puppy, again, I've got it blanked off. Pop that blank out of there. And that just allows the air out of the bag as the water enters in there and displaces it. So I just pop that up behind the seat so it's nice and high. And don't forget about it. Otherwise, your Mrs. Seat gets covered in a puddle of water and she will not be happy. Now, when I'm in remote areas and water is an issue, like in the deserts, I will decant out of this bag in 20 liter aliquots. So when my jerry can's empty, I'll simply pop that into the jerry can and fill that jerry can up to the 20 liter mark. The reason that I do that is that allows me to keep track of what volume that I've got in this bag. And that's really important for water management, knowing how much water you've got left. And here's a classic example of what I was talking about. I'm in a small rural town called Ningen in New South Wales, and they've got water tap in the park. Now you can drop your jerry can underneath that in this particular instance, because it's tall enough. Oftentimes they're not tall enough, or if you don't want to hump the can out of your car, you get yourself your own fitting that you carry. You screw that little puppy onto the end of the tap, and away you go. You fill up your container using your own hose. Now here's a hot little tip when you're filling from towns. Get yourself one of these things. That's called a water key and you can pick those up at any hardware store. I think I got that at Bunnings for a few bucks. In many towns they don't have the typical tap. You'll need one of these keys to be able to turn the water on and off. So grab yourself one of those. It'll save you a little bit of heartache because if you pull up and you want to get water and you can't actually turn the tap on, that's a little bit of a bummer but that'll save your bacon. Now the other way that you're going to get water, of course, is sourcing it in the bush when you're on the trails. And I use three main methodologies to get water when I'm out in the bush. One is dipping the jerry can, two is with my pump, drawing it with the pump and the little foot valve I've got on the pump, and three is using the sand spear. Let's have a look at each one of those methodologies now in a little bit more detail. So the first and easiest way to do a refill is obviously walking up to the edge of the water and simply filling her like that. Refill method number one, not hard. Refill method number two is not much more difficult than the first one. Underneath here, I've got my suction line. I simply plug that suction line in here. Grab your foot valve. I've got the sand spear here. Plunk it in your nearest stream and use the pump to draw the water up to 
fill up your containers. Another way that these sand filters work is if you've got moist soil, you can simply dig yourself a hole. So you strike that water, bury that sand filter in your hole, and there you go, you're good as gold. That'll be a perfectly easy way to draw up water out of a creek where you don't have a whole lot of depth to work with. For those that are unfamiliar with a sand filter, this is what they look like. It's basically a piece of stainless steel and it's got tiny little grooves in it. And the grooves obviously allow the water through but stop the sand from getting in. And that prevents your pump from getting all plugged up. They're a brilliant little bloody bit of kit. Now one thing that I do do, and some of you might call, call me a little bit anal for this, but as you can see on this drum it's got a red cap and on some of my other drums they've got blue caps. What I do if I'm pulling water out of a dam like the one here behind me, I'll put it in a jug and I'll put a red cap on it. And that's basically telling me that that's not potable water and that I should boil that if I intend drinking that or not. Anything with a blue cap is good clean drinking water. So despite the fact that this dam looks beautiful and peaceful, the fact of the matter is there's probably a whole host of cow piss in there. So this is a red cap dam. Well that concludes this short video on carrying, using and refilling water when I'm out on the road camping. And of course we did cover off a little bit on the shower system in the truck which hey, I rate that so very highly. If you don't have one, get yourself one. They're fantastic. Thanks for watching everybody. Keep the shiny side up. We'll see you on the next video. Have a good one. Bye now.